Yes, thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, I uh, have a long history of working with superconducting circuits. And uh, in this presentation, I don't go into details to explain one part of on my cell phone, some pictures later. Anyway, you see it on a big optical table and approaches, but still by far too big. You can it, but you can carry a chip. We have a dry edged hole in this. The hole holds the fiber. And then there is the album nitride detector flip chip bonded. And the challenge here is the uh, active alignment of this uh, album nitride chip during the thermal compression bonding with a, a absolute precision of better than 0.5 micro. The current detectors, that's fine. But uh, we are now working on a system which has 8 by 8 optical fibers on an area of 100 by 100 micrometer. So this gives you the idea that it's it quite uh, challenging. So this is how the integration of, of one of these devices is. This is a silicon chip and the etched hole. And then uh, the fiber, you can guess here, the fiber goes to this little uh, microwave package to, to build the system. This is something we have available as a product. Uh, so if people have a cryo cooler, they can put it in and have a single channel detector. And the new system will be 64 channels. And uh, this is a different uh, nanowire detector. And here you can see again the optical fiber going through this hole. And we need this approach, but we need a much higher density uh, because this fiber is still 125 micrometer in diameter. So this is uh, a very practical problem if you think about it, but you need to have a scalable solution. Optical fibers are very attra attractive because of the very high bandwidth and data rate and uh, of the low thermal load you bring to the cryostat. Actually, this was a picture of our inside of the cryostat. This is 4 by 4 centimeter, so we don't have more space in this. But we are uh, aiming to operate the quantum system there. So the assembly process we are using is based on gold stud bumps. So this is a aced chip uh, with niobium nitri uh, excuse me, with niobium pads. And we are putting little gold stud bumps on this. And then uh, the second tins later of about five, uh, 15 micrometer. And we have a diameter of the bond of about 80 micrometer. So this is uh, good for uh, thermal cycling down to 10 millikelvin if you need. And this is also good for data rates over 20 gigabit per second. For higher density of connections and for higher data rates, we use uh, copper pillars or gold pillars. And these are the pillars. And uh, they are in an uh, electroplating process grown on the chip. So the big difference is that you can reach a much higher density. So it's also a practical solution. We do this in, in our clean room. And this is a particular bad sample where you have a big misalignment of the top and the bottom chip. But then you can see the top pillar and the bottom pillar, and you still see it's a 100% yield in the electrical contact. If you do a perfect alignment, you don't see the step, and then you think it's just one piece. And uh, that's why we're using this picture. If we do the comparison, this is just for the flip chip bonding. We have the stud bumping process with about 100 contacts per square millimeter. And we have the pillar process with about 1,600 contacts per square millimeter. We did, for instance, a CMOS memory array with no decoder and a superconducting decoder. Then you need, for each control line, you need a bump, and then you need a high density. But it's a very attractive combination to take the best of the two technologies. We also use this for different projects where you, for instance, assemble LEDs or other devices. So next component is a very energy efficient superconducting circuit. So we are using the AQFP development from Yokohama National University. And for those of you who know me, I'm also a professor at Yokohama National University. And we have very interesting and attractive uh, details. For those of you who are interested, please ask me later. And uh, so the AQFP has not only very low energy dissipation. Ah, yeah, OK. It also has the ability to do a complex uh, circuit integration. This is an example of a, a register file with uh, three decoders. So you have two uh, uh, read access and one write access to a memory array. And this is all uh, in AQFP logic. 
And then you can combine this, for instance, with uh, VTM memory cells, and then uh, some power numbers, but I don't want to go into detail of those. I just want to show you. So the biggest uh, success so far, for my understanding, is uh, an AQFP-based uh, one-bit microprocessor, fully functional. Actually, uh, the microprocessor uh, uh, ALU is this tiny ping thing, and the rest is the register file and the controller. Anyway, we need to combine AQFPs, next component. So then we have to have some amplification. And one of the very attractive devices is called Entron. It's developed by Carl Beckham's group at MIT. And we are using Entrons now in, on our uh, chips and assemble them. The Entron has a superconducting channel, which is about 200, nanome uh, 200 micrometer, uh, sorry, nanometer wide. And then we have a very narrow constraint which goes in a range of 30 nanometer down. And here you inject quasi-particles into the channel and you can switch the whole channel normal. The interesting thing is you have a large current gain and you have a very fast reset. And if you put a superconducting load to this device, it cannot develop voltage, so it doesn't develop heat, and it resets extremely fast. If you connect a 50 ohm load, you develop voltage and it's not so fast. But just to give you uh, interesting, uh, simple experimental results, this is the Entron device at low speed. We have a drain current of 140 microamp. We trigger this with a signal of six microamp. Actually, the threshold is something like three. And then we can build up 600 millivolt in voltage at the output. So it's a very attractive amplifier. At high speed, it's not so large voltage because you need a 50 ohm load. So this is a high-speed operation, some mismatch because it was not a very good microwave setup, but we still have a 10 millivolt output signal of the same Entron device. And this is attractive because with this voltage, you can already go to uh, CMOS circuits. So how does it look like in the assembly? So this is an AQFP uh, test circuit from AST, and then we have the gold stud bumps, and this is a uh, single Entron device so the Entron is a very tiny thing in the center, which is one by one micrometer. And then this chip gets flip chip bonded into this gold stud bumps. And this is how it looks like after bonding. You don't see anything uh, more. But uh, the interesting thing is, even if you have a little piece of gold in the superconducting uh, environment, you don't see the normal resistor because of the time constants. So in uh, this has a RC time constant of something like a millisecond. So as long as you operate this at the gigahertz, you have one million clock cycles until you recognize it's actually normal. So for normal uh, information exchange, uh, it behaves superconducting. This is how the assembly looks like. This is a cross section here. You see the gold stud bumps. This is one entron, but now we have chips which have also 64 entrons on one device. And last component is cryogenic CMOS. CMOS still has the highest density of circuits, and you need to uh, use CMOS, but you need to use it at low temperature. It's a challenge, so you have to change the process parameters. We are using still a TSMC 65 nanometer process, and this is a cross-section how the, uh, the circuit looks like. And um, then the interesting thing is that the um, transistor behavior at, four cal uh, sorry, at room temperature which has a certain slope, changes uh, at 4 Kelvin to have a very steep transition here. And this is only noise from the semiconductor parameter analyzer. Please recognize it's not the same scale. This is 10 to the minus 10. This is 10 to the minus 12 here. And if I operate my circuit in this range, I can have a very uh, high speed and still a low power consumption. But you have to change the transistor layout. So you cannot use the transistor IP or the memory IP from the uh, provider. I don't want to go into details, but this is some numbers. For instance, uh, this is a circuit operation. At 0.4 volt, uh, you can have 300 megahertz. At 1.2 volt, you can have 5 gigahertz of the CMOS circuit. And you can also get the power numbers for this. And now you need to assemble everything. The problem is flip chip bonding only works once. If you have three chips, then how, how to bring the third chip to that? So we also need interposers uh, for the integration and the optical fiber connection through holes. And how this all looks together, I will show maybe on the next uh, conference. It's not yet finished, but uh, our idea is 
to move from these approaches to something which is all very compact on, on one. It's not a single die, but it's a very hybrid system from four or five different technologies, but at the end of a cubic centimeter size. With 64 optical fibers, with a lot of electrical connections, a lot means uh, maybe 20 DC and 4 AC, because we use a big CMOS uh, decoder and serial to parallel converter. Otherwise, you don't bring the data. Yep. What, what is the biggest Okay, let me repeat the question. What is the biggest CMOS RAM we can integrate? So far, what we have done is 64 kilobit, but it's only because we never needed a bigger memory. And uh, in the 65 nanometer uh, node, uh, maybe one megabit, uh, the question is, do you maybe in one megabit range at the moment? But can, can you go to more industrial, uh, bigger scale of RAM integration? You don't see any because there was a the obstacle to the qubits. I don't see a need for more than a megabit. I see. So a gigabit, you can use far away at room temperature. All right. But you have to have efficient, high-speed data links. And uh, if you check your computer, they have extremely fast serial data links now. All right. Thank you. Is there a question from the uh, online side? Ah, yeah. How about the operating temperature of this hybrid system? It's a very good question, because so far the limiting factor is the CMOS, which doesn't go below 3 Kelvin. And the full, I mean, the, the transmon qubits will be at 10 millikelvin, so we still have a challenge. We are thinking about splitting the CMOS still in two parts. There is a warm CMOS and a cold CMOS, but so far I have not seen any CMOS circuit working at 20 millikelvin. And I also have some doubts. Uh, maybe we will have a CMOS stage and the AQFP stage just doing the interface to the qubit. But this is not solved yet. Yeah. No question. Uh, I have a techni technical question. And I, I saw that your bridge is connected to the superconducting wire. It's the bridge uh, width is uh, around 40 nanometer, very, very thin. How to preserve this kind of the thin structure? Because we, if you touch it, if you, uh, if you didn't ground it, and then you can blow up to this bridge. Actually, uh, this device is extremely robust because uh, it's not a junction, there's no barrier. Mm -hmm. It's just a pure nitrate nitride constraint. So even if you, I mean, the problem is temperature. If you have immersed this in liquid helium, mm -hmm. uh, I never managed to destroy one. If you put this on a cryocooler, you have to be a little bit more careful because if you heat it up too much, uh, you have a problem. But we drive this gate, which needs about two to three microamp. We drive this with an SFQ gate. And then there's no risk. If you drive this from an external pattern generator for test purposes, like we did in this oscilloscope screenshots, you should have a significant attenuation at your chip, like putting uh, 50 ohm to ground and a mega ohm to the device. Okay. One more question, yeah. What's, what's the possible usage of diamond centers? Is it a quantum memory from your point of view? Because so they don't have the good integration uh, ability. So, so by, on, the other, on the other hand, they can store quantum information for quite a long time, like one millisecond to one second. So now we, we switch completely topics. So the, I mentioned diamond because we are interested in, in two things, diamond sensors, let me answer this later, and uh, synthetic diamond-based uh, quantum computing. In this case, we have a lot of qubits uh, very close together, and they have a magnetic spin coupling, so their distance needs to be below 100 nanometer from qubit to qubit. But this is not a diamond or a, a quantum sensor. This is really a quantum computing device. We built uh, already diamond-based sensors, but uh, 
I would say this is like building a laser. This is a, a, a big pile of uh, quantum events uh, synchronized. So this is not a single NV center measuring. And uh, the biggest uh, advantage of, for instance, a diamond-based current sensor is that you don't need to calibrate this. Uh, you derive the current from uh, very visible principles and it's stable over the whole lifetime. Uh, maybe it breaks, but it doesn't drift. And this is very attractive for industry to say, I have a sensor and it's either working correct and gives me the right number or it's broken. Thank you. Any question? No. Okay. Uh, let's thank the speaker again. And let me just give you a